Thank you for coming this evening. This is the fourth Purdue Engineering Distinguished uh, Lecture this semester. Uh, and uh, this lecture series actually started uh, in 2018. And the intent is really to get some world-renowned scholars and professionals from around the world uh, to come to Purdue Engineering and uh, really spend some time involving themselves in deep conversations with their students and faculty uh, about the grand challenges, really, uh, in the discipline. And as a part of the whole uh, visit, they, of course, meet with a lot of people, uh, but they also do a lecture, uh, which is going to happen now. Uh, and they also do a panel or a fireside chat that just happened for those of you who were able to make it for that excellent uh, event as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Dimitrios Pirolis, uh, the Michael and Catherine head of the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering, as well as the Riley Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering, to introduce our speaker for this evening. <laughs> Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's really my special uh, pleasure and uh, it's, our, it's our wonderful honor to have uh, Ms. Uh, Laila Ibrahim uh, with us tonight. Our very own, as I would like to mention, uh, because uh, Ms. Ibrahim not only got a bachelor's degree from the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering, but she was also raised in West Lafayette. <laughs> and we also have the pleasure of having her parents here uh, with us tonight. So let's give a round of applause for the whole family. <laughs> um, it's really wonderful. Um, now on a more technical note, I would like to say that uh, Ms. Ibrahim is actually now with uh, DeepMind. In fact, she's the Chief Operations Officer uh, as of last April, April of 19. And uh, she's really taking DeepMind to the next level in managing their next phase of growth. So uh, she's actually their first ever uh, Chief Operations Officer. Now, before that, uh, she was the Chief Operations Officer of Coursera. And she was responsible there for talent, people operations, and business operations in finance, IT, and facilities. Now, while at Coursera, she was also the Senior Operating Partner at uh, Kleiner Perkins. And uh, there she focused on the firm's digital and uh, green tech portfolios until 2015. As if that was uh, not amazing, um, before joining Clarion Perkins, she was actually with um, Intel for 18 years, where she actually spanned technical marketing and management positions, all of them at the leadership level at Intel. And uh, she also served as the chief of staff to Intel chairman, Craig Barrett. Among the many honors, um, she is the Henry Crown Fellow at the Aspen Institute. This is an honor bestowed on uh, emerging leaders. And I would also like to mention something on the more personal side, uh, that outside of work, Lila is also um, has established several computer labs at the Lebanese orphanage where her father was raised. She holds, as I already mentioned, a bachelor's degree. Uh, and again, it's a huge honor to welcome Laila. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for uh, joining me tonight and to those of you uh, online as well. It really is a great honor to be back at Purdue. Um, I, as mentioned, I joined DeepMind 18 months ago. And I'm excited to share what I've learned as DeepMind's first chief operating officer, and know that we're on this journey of learning, uh, including my time here at Purdue, where I've spent uh, a very packed visit learning about the exciting things happening on campus. Today's talk will really focus on artificial intelligence. And I hope that I leave you with some optimism about what this transformational technology can bring but also bring some awareness of the types of questions and considerations that we have underway at DeepMind. Uh, this is a picture of my visit in July. I'll get out of the way so you can see my cute twin daughters. Um, as mentioned, I, I was raised in Lafayette, and uh, I was back here over the summer and just happened to be the Apollo 50th anniversary. And it was so exciting to bring my kids here and to participate and produce activities. And, to get them excited about engineering as well. And the reason I wanted to share this picture, not only because it's truly an honor to be here, but also because when I took this job and I'm working on AI, this is what I keep in mind. 
My daughters are growing up with technology that is unprecedented in the way that it has imp impacted all of our lives. So what their future is going to look like with AI as an ingredient in their lives is something that's very much on my mind. What's also on my mind is my responsibility pioneering in this field and the type of world that I'm creating that my daughter and this generation will live in. So, I, uh, so th that, just so you understand kind of my own personal motivations for some of the work in AI, it's right, it's right there. So today we'll cover three topics. First, I'll give a brief overview of DeepMind. Uh, just a quick hand, how many of you had heard of DeepMind before my visit? Oh, wow, great, okay. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about research, the kind of research we're doing, and about the responsibilities that we have in doing and why we have to proceed with the utmost, uh, utmost kind of caution and putting ourselves from thinking about things from the highest standards. And then on the last one, I'll do a little bit of reflection in the last section on what we're doing, and then we'll open it up for Q&A, just to kind of give you an idea of what to expect tonight. So first, a quick introduction. Um, and I want to say that what did I do to prepare for this role? So first chief operating officer, my responsibilities include engineering, research engineering. We have an environment, games environment, in which we train and test our agents, traditional operations of people, finance, legal. I have ethics, ethics researchers working for me as well. So it's a pretty broad scope. And in some ways, I think my time at Purdue actually really prepared me for this, as did my career. So maybe before I get a, um, into DeepMind, let me take a moment to introduce myself. And as I'm talking a little bit about my background, keep in mind, um, I was reading on the Purdue website about the Engineering 2020 initiative. And the type of work that Purdue is really trying to invest in having leadership roles for Purdue alum uh, to respond to global, technology, economic, and societal challenges of the 21st century. So I think you've made a good choice by being here. Um, so first step on the way of my life, right there, pictures of, of me as a, a child here in Lafayette. And uh, this is really formative time for me because I grew up as a the dark-haired kid in my uh, neighborhood and in my school. I was different. I was a child of immigrants. Um, I, uh, English was my second language. And so I didn't know some of the basic terms that were part of American culture. In fact, yesterday I caught up with a, an elementary school classmate over at the Burke uh, building. And I remembered like listening to American radio and having, uh, what was it, chicken dumplings for the first time. So. This is my childhood, and what was really transformational or t impactful about this time was the Midwest values that I grew up with um, and really being, being comfortable with being different. One of those pictures up there is from my time as an exchange student in Japan in 1986, where I went from being the foreigner in America to being the American in a city of 40,000 people in Japan. I stuck out a lot. <laughs> but I learned Japanese, and it really got me comfortable being in an environment that I didn't know much about and having to sort through things. I joined Purdue um, as an electrical engineer. I was a co-op at Purdue, and uh, I co opted with a company called Intel. You've heard of Intel? Okay. Uh, before I went to my co-op interviews, my dad said, don't tell them you don't like computers. So that was very good advice. Uh, I got the job at Intel, the co-op. I worked on something called the Pentium Processor as my first co-op experience. I then went on uh, for an 18-year career at Intel. That included working in eight different roles in three different countries. So I worked on uh, DVD standards in Japan at a time when people didn't think you would watch movies on a computer. I got to help build the internet and compute infrastructure in countries that didn't have internet access or communities that didn't have internet access. There was fear about jobs going away because of um, the internet access or computers. And instead, we had to take an approach of how do we involve the local community to integrate this technology in a way that was deliberate and purposeful and have a positive impact. Uh, my time at Intel was phenomenal. Um, including, as mentioned, chief of staff to the CEO and chairman who made Intel a powerhouse. His 
background in order to be CEO of Intel, a $40 billion company at the time, 85,000 employees, was a PhD in material science and a lot of on-the-job training. So when you hear my background, I just have a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and a lot of really uh, diverse experiences. So I was recruited out of Intel to Kleiner Perkins. This is the venture capital firm that made the first investments in companies you'll have heard of, like Google, like Amazon. And so I went into a well-established, prominent venture capital, and I took my entrepreneurial skills from Intel and applied them into an entrepreneurial environment. From there, one of the companies, I did diligence on a lot of companies, including Twitter, including Coursera, um, including a handfuls of others. Um, and one, when I, after doing the diligence on a company which became Coursera, I went in as, uh, before the company was even 40 people, as the first business executive, outside business executive, to partner with the two founders in order to, uh, who were both faculty members at Stanford and needed some help in building the company. And my generalist skill sets, my, my uh, diversity of experiences that I had, but with, found it in a technical roots, enabled me to do that job. I then decided I would take a year off to go catch up with life because it had been pretty busy. And about one month into my year off, I got an opportunity to interview with DeepMind in London. And moving from Silicon Valley to London was quite a transformation. Uh, when I was interviewing in January with London weather. So I, the Indiana weather had been beaten out of me by then. Um, and today, this is really going to be my focus. But I thought it was important to give you my background because you'll see here that I've done a little bit of a lot of different things. And to move into an executive role at a company that is pioneering and doing something that's never been done before relies a lot on having people at the top who can help navigate, who are grounded, in, uh, in, in values who understand the impact that technology can have on the world. Um, and one of the things I've learned in my career is I have a passion for where technology intersects with societal impact. And how can we make technology benefit people, benefit the economy, and benefit and create more opportunity? So, I joined DeepMind, and when I first interviewed, I looked at this, this mission. Here's our phenomenal mission that I thought was quite audacious. Solve intelligence, okay? And then use that to solve everything else. This is DeepMind's mission. <laughs> Pretty straightforward, right? Um, so let me give you a little bit of background of DeepMind. In 2010, DeepMind was founded by uh, three people, uh, Demis Hassabis, Shane Legg, and Mustafa Sleiman, and they founded it in London, where Shane and Demis had both met at a university and had this crazy idea about how to solve intelligence. And they got there to the same idea, but from very different routes. One was a child chess prodigy, gaming, uh, had done gaming companies and studied neuroscience, and the other one came from a math background. And the fact that they had gotten aligned was, was pretty phenomenal. They in 2014, were acquired by Google, but then Google became, you know, Alphabet had the big restructuring, so right now DeepMind is a sister company to Google within Alph Alphabet. The founders were inspired. If they could understand what intelligence really means, then we can cre recreate it. If you can recreate intelligence, could we create a tool that could help solve some of the questions facing society and the underlying, impact, uh, underlying aspect was having a positive impact. Now, what is intelligence? Surely this is, there's gotta be like some roadmap to this, right? Well, it turns out that there's, it's a pretty contentious question because there's not a clear definition. So here's one from Richard Gregory, who's a, one of the most prominent psychologists of our time, who said in 1998, innumerable tests are available for measuring intelligence yet no one is quite certain of what intelligence is or even what they're measuring. So it's really not that clear. I had a deep mind research scientist explain it to me this way. So she said, give me a name of your friend. I said D. She said, okay, let, let's say D is the representative of human intelligence. 
If I ask Dee to take a seat, she will know what a seat is, she'll know what it means to sit. And then I ask Dee, hey, can you play a game of checkers with me? Um, can you navigate your way around Purdue campus? Um, can, let's cook dinner together. Like all of those things you could probably ask Dee and Dee would generally understand and be able to, to do that. Uh, she'd do just fine. So it's one learning system, one brain, doing a lot of different activities and performing adequately in all of them. So think of that as like general intelligence. That's how we think of it within DeepMind. Contrast a less intelligent system, for lack of a better example, the Indiana state bird is a cardinal. So a cardinal can fly around and navigate uh, Indiana, but you ask it to play a game of checkers and you're probably not going to have much luck. So again, we think of it as like generality, the generality aspect, and I'll talk more about that, is how we think of intelligence within DeepMind. Now, most people think of apply, um, artificial intelligence and they think of one of these activities. Who's used Google Translate? Ah, yes, great. Thank you. Um, watched a movie from Netflix or listened to something from Spotify because it was recommended, right? Okay, or you're typing a text message and there's an auto predict. Okay, these are all examples of narrow AI feed a lot of data based on the data we're giving a specific direction, a specific action. Um, so this is really what we think of as narrow AI. But what is DeepMind doing that's different? Let's say I, I show you this very colorful background and I think, okay, advanced AI. We want something that can process a large amount of data, different types of information around the world, about the world around us. We want a uh, system that's gonna make sense of this data and learn from it. And the kind of AI we wanna create, we don't, it doesn't need to be told what to do. And it, maybe it doesn't even know how to solve the problem uh, or even what the problem really is. But we think it could find patterns that humans might take years to spot or maybe never even see. Uh, so one example of this, if you think about it, maybe you look up at the stars at night and you wonder, is there a pattern here? Is there something that I don't know? Despite all the brain power then and that humans have, there are so many problems that we haven't been able to solve. And the idea with this artificial general intelligence is, can it help us be used as a tool to help us solve some of these problems and spot trends that we can't even imagine? So. The world is full of complex problems. How do we make sense of the universe? What could we do about climate change? How do we think about new materials? Can we prevent disease? Can we manage disease? Uh, as I mentioned, like the human brain power within this room here, this campus, this state, this country, this world at this time has still not solved so many of the challenges that are facing humanity. So our idea is to build this tool, this system, this advanced artificial intelligence system that can learn how to complete a broadest set of tasks and perform at human level against those different tasks. It could be one of humanity's most useful inventions. At least that's why we're excited about it. Um, we think that artificial in, uh, intelligence can help scientists, engineers, and others kind of unlock knowledge and answer some of the fundamental questions. Now, at DMind, we think about this in two different ways. Um, we think of AI as a science and AI for science. So AI as a science is really trying to say, how do we think about artificial, advanced artificial intelligence and how, what can we do to advance what that really means and what it's capable of? Um, so if I was in a product organization, which I've been in, I would think about, if I was developing a product, I would think about, okay, what problem am I trying to solve? Who are my users? How can I get a product prototype and then test it and iterate quickly and get it to market? But we're talking about what are the fundamental building blocks of intelligence? I bet if you talked to your neighbor and gave each other answers, you'd be completely different things of like what you think the fundamental building blocks are for intelligence. So we've taken a very scientific approach at DeepMind, 
which is we come up with our hypothesis. We do this every six months. What's our hypothesis on the research? Uh, then we test it, we build it out. Our research engineers help us build it out. We test it, and then we pivot based on that. So it's not like there's a super clear roadmap. Instead, we're taking a very long-term scientific approach to solving this problem. There are three main uh, hypotheses that underpin a lot of what we're doing. Those are generality, kind of what I mentioned before, of building a system uh, that can learn, adapt, and perform in many different tasks. There's creativity. So if you want an artificial intelligence system to actually learn on its own, you have to give it the ability to really learn and make inferences for itself. And from that comes an element of creativity. You also want to build something that can, not, that can handle the complexities of the real world. Now, the real world is messy and imperfect and ill-defined. So these three things, uh, while they seem pretty simple are, uh, as main vectors for our research, are, are still pretty complex in themselves. So I'm going to step through uh, an example for each of these. Has anyone heard of AlphaGo? OK. So it, I appreciate the audience participation. Thank you. Um, so Go is a game that's played in Asia. It's over 2,000 years old. So think about it, this. For 2,000 years, humans have been playing this game. They have been studying it. They have been perfecting it. They study strategies. They adapt. And so it's become this holy grail of artificial intelligence. Because certainly, no machine could learn how to play Go. There are more moves than atoms in the world. It is literally impossible to predict every single move and program it. Uh, and so what happened was, in 2016, we published a nature paper that described an artificial intelligence system that learned how to play Go on its own. Uh, this was about a decade ahead of what people thought was remotely possible. And I really can't underscore the importance and what a significant scientific breakthrough this was, but fortunately, there's a movie made about it, so I'm going to show you a quick snippet to give you a sense of what AlphaGo was really about. Go is the world's oldest continuously played board game. It is one of the simplest and also most abstract. Beating a professional player at Go is a long-standing challenge of artificial intelligence. Everything we've ever tried in AI just falls over when you try the game of Go. The number of possible configurations of the board is more than the number of atoms in the universe. AlphaGo found a way to learn how to play Go. So far, AlphaGo has beaten every challenge we've given it, but we won't know its true strength until we play somebody who is at the top of the world, like Lisa Dong. A match like no other is about to get underway in South Korea. They said all is to go what Roger Federer is to tennis. Just the very thought of a machine playing a human is inherently intriguing. The place is a madhouse. Welcome to the Deep Mind Challenge. The whole world is watching. Can Lee Sadal find AlphaGo's weakness? Ooh. Whoa. Oh, is there, in fact, a weakness? The game kind of turned on its axis. Well, look at his face. That is not a confident face. It's developing into a very, very dangerous fight. Ooh, hold the phone. Lee has left the room. In the end, it is about pride. I think there's something went wrong. wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's made in the tank. He's got up with the miracle. These ideas that are driving AlphaGo are going to drive our future. This is it, folks. <laughs> you can, uh, uh I highly recommend the movie. As you can tell, uh, you wouldn't think a documentary about uh, the, uh, the game of Go could be so emotionally compelling. Um, but I, I definitely think it is. Um, so last year, we took uh, the same techniques from AlphaGo, and we applied them to Alpha to something we called Alpha Zero, so an evolution of AlphaGo. It learned how to play Go on its own, but also and, and also win. And same for chess and same for Shogi. So what was interesting is a single algorithm did those three games. Learn to play them, learn to win. Uh, but it's not about the winning. It was about how, how this happened. 
Um, it was without human training, without human instruction. It was basically been given uh, basic rules and told whether it's won or, or lost. And uh, we used a process for those of you in this field who will know uh, reinforcement learning. It was general, generalizable, and that's kind of what the Alpha Zero proved, is we could take the Alpha Go and we could then generalize that learning to other games. Now, one thing I found very interesting as a hardware engineer is imagine taking that algorithm and putting it in a time machine and like moving it back uh, to maybe when I was at school at Purdue. Um, it couldn't have run. The compute power wasn't there. So this is part of the reason you're seeing this now. All the data that's available, the compute power, and having the algorithms uh, in hand. So the other thing that was interesting about AlphaGo and AlphaZero was that it became creative. It introduced us to new ways about thinking about, decade, uh, about very old, well-played games. So part of this is because it wasn't trained by a human, it wasn't bound by the human way of playing. So there's a move in there uh, in the movie AlphaGo about move 37, which is quite famous because it was the moment where everyone thought, oh, AlphaGo did something wrong. Like, the, what is this? It, it, it shouldn't have played this. It's going to lose. But actually, it turns out that that was the moment that the whole game changed. And what Lisa Dahl said afterwards was, I thought AlphaGo was based on probability calculation, and it was merely a machine. But when I saw this movie, when I saw this move, I changed my mind. Surely AlphaGo is creative. And what he has said since then is, in fact, that um, he has really rethought many ways and many strategies based on his experience in playing AlphaGo. Also, on AlphaZero, which was the one that played Go and Shogi and uh, chess, we had a couple players were so fascinated by the moves that they actually studied intensely AlphaZero for six months and wrote a book about some of the moves that AlphaZero made. So again, kind of reimagining the way that we were looking at uh, the strategies of these games. OK, so that was on generality and creativity. So, and, and they were board games. And while they're complex, they're pretty straightforward. Now let's talk about real-time strategy games, because the real world is messy and imperfect and complicated. Um, so we took StarCraft. Any StarCraft players? OK, a couple. So we took StarCraft, uh, and we said, now here's a complicated game. It is, um, I'm, not, I'm not a StarCraft player, so I, might, I hope I get this right. Um, the folks in the audience will set me straight if not. Um, but because it is one of the most challenging games, and uh, it also has a lot of pros, so there, if we want to play world-class folks, we can do that with StarCraft II. Uh, and the way that the game works, in my understanding, is players balance these short-term tasks of like constructing buildings or controlling units with like long-term strategies to try to win the game, managing resources. And it's not turn-based. It's not my turn, then your turn. Things are happening all at the same time, and much of the gameplay is actually hidden from, the, hidden from others, the gameplay map. It's more complex than chess, so players control hundreds of units at any one time. It's more complex than Go. There's 10 to the 26 possible choices for every move. And players have less information than, about their opponents than even a game like poker. Did I kind of get that right? OK, so far. <laughs> um, so last month, we published a paper on an advanced um, AI system called Alpha Star. And Alpha Star was a general system that played and won uh, pro, beat pros on a fully unrestricted game of StarCraft II. And it was a world's first. And uh, you know, I wasn't aware of this, but a lot of uh, universities actually use StarCraft II as a training platform for uh, students uh, on AI. So this was pretty significant. Uh, this shows us that general purpose learning techniques can scale to complex situations like StarCraft Craft II. Now, I think um, to kind of wrap up this uh, section, we see uh, that we're basing general intelligence on, gener is it generalizable? Is it creative? Can we have it deal with the complexity of the real world? 
What's been exciting is that our scientific focus on AI, we've published 10 papers in uh, top tier academic journals, and you can kind of see the, the history of like Atari to Go, uh, to Chess, Shogi, and Checker, uh, uh, and yeah, Shogi and Chess to now StarCraft II, so kind of the evolution. We, and this is just um, this week's cover of Nature Magazine. We've also published over 600 papers and peer-reviewed uh, that are on archive. And I think all of this kind of shows of AI as a research focus. This is the kind of work, long-term work that DeepMind does. But what about applying what we've built here into real-world problems, that second part of the mission of AI for science? What if we could do things like simulate proteins enough to design better enzymes for catalyzing waste processing, or more efficiently sequester carbon uh, from the atmosphere, or predict, predict mechanisms of common and, and rare diseases alike, um, or help researchers accelerate other scientific discoveries. So this is kind of where we're taking the algorithms and what we've learned in developing AI and trying to apply it to real world problems. Um, much in the same way telescopes really gave us information about the universe. So I'm going to give you two examples here of using AI for science. Uh, the first here is a protein folding. Um, it was our first significant milestone in demonstrating how AI could be used for scientific uh, discovery. So every function in our body is, can be traced back to proteins, and how the proteins fold determine what activity and what function they have within our body. And predicting how proteins fold really um, has been a longstanding biology challenge. Um, if you can predict how proteins fold, you can also predict how they misfold. And that could really give us better insight into things like Alzheimer's or cystic fibrosis. And so there has been a longstanding challenge of can you predict protein folding and therefore misfolding. Uh, in 2018, at the end of last year, we introduced some, uh, our AI system called AlphaFold, and it uses the same deep learning techniques and it, to try to predict the 3D models of proteins. Um, this, uh, this is not done. It's still very early, but we made significant scientific advancements in this space in a, sh in a relatively short amount of time, given the nature of the, the challenge. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done here, but it is an example of how we're partnering with the scientific community to try to advance research in some of these areas. Another area that I'm personally quite passionate about is climate change. So here we have two examples. On, on the top, we know that um, wind can, has really taken off the past few years in terms of trying to re, uh, re reduce carbon emission. Uh, an important source of carbon-free electricity. The problem with wind, it's not reliable. Uh, it varies. So if you want to generate some amount of power, it's not like I can say at the certain time I need this type of, type of output from the wind farm. So what we did is we partnered with Google. And we took uh, data that's readily available about uh, weather forecasts and historical turbine data, and we were able to predict the wind output 36 hours in advance of actual generation, which allowed us to actually do a full day in advance of committing that same wind energy into the grid. So it, the net of this was making the wind 20% the wind more valuable on an existing infrastructure of a wind farm. So just adding in uh, our alpha, uh, Sorry, this one was not an alpha, um, adding in our algorithms. Now, that's energy generation. What about energy consumption? This is a picture of a Google data center. Data centers consume about 3% of uh, the world's energy, a huge issue. So the idea was, could we, we piloted this, could we make an impact by applying some of our artificial intelligence systems into uh, data centers? Uh, we were able to reduce the power for cooling Google-specific data centers by 30%. Again, existing infrastructure. Um, and still early, still applying AI to these problems. Small step. It's not just DeepMind working on these uh, problems, but it does kind of show that we can start applying the uh, artificial intelligence to help us 
create a better environment. So it's a little bit about what DeepMind is doing. Now, if you have questions about all of this, you should. Like, uh, if you, you're kind of conflicted of like, OK, I, this is really cool, but I have all of these other questions. Lila, are you going to talk about those? So here's where I really want to just take a step back and say, uh, we don't think you make the world a better place by accident. You have to be deliberate. You have to be purposeful. You have to ask yourself really uncomfortable questions and have tough conversations um, about what does this mean? What implications could this have um, in order to, to basically pioneer responsibly? Um, and as I mentioned, this was really a big decision point for me when I moved to DeepMind. Now I'm like looking at, at kind of my, my role and saying, wow, I, I'm leading this organization that's doing phenomenal advanced AI work. Um, it, and yet it's so hard to conceive what the future will look like. Um, I go back to when I was a student here, could I have imagined uh, the kind of work I had been able to do in, in taking technology forward in the advancements that people would be sitting there with their, their phones taking pictures or watching videos on something that, you know, I mean, it's just amazing the transformation we've seen. So how do we balance the short-term, mid-term, and long-term risks and the implications? I ask myself this all the time. And it's actually been one of the main areas of my focus within DeepMind of figuring out how do we operationalize some of these questions within the company. Um, so one of the things uh, I, I do, as I mentioned, is I oversee our cross-functional uh, cross efforts to really look at the ethics questions related to our work. And it really requires three things. So being the non-AI person, I pull people around the table and the collaboration is key. Um, example of this would be, can we bring a diverse set of stakeholders? So we have engineers around the table, we have go legal government affairs, we have people dealing with public engagement, we have ethics researchers, we're having a conversation of what implications does this research have or could have? Uh, we're thoughtful and open about talking about what the challenges could be around this research. Even though we may not all have the answers, we feel it's important to have the conversation. And when we make a decision, we recognize the decision we're making today may not be relevant tomorrow or the next day or the next year. So how do we allow ourselves that adaptability? Um, I'm not going to summarize all the challenges around how do we pioneer responsibility. I will touch on three very quickly. Safety is a long-term issue. This is how do we make sure systems act the way that we want them to act. Multi-use, there's challenges and opportunity for the technologies. How do we make those trade-offs? And bias and fairness. How do we make sure the systems that we're developing are actually fair? Um, so first, let's go into safety. A uh, common question I hear from people, thanks to Hollywood, what about the Terminators? And, oh, those out-of-control robots. Do you have out-of-control robots? We don't. Um, I actually believe this is kind of an unlikely scenario given the type of research we do. Uh, that said, we are interested in AI safety. And this really means, how do you ensure that humans are always in the loop? That humans are part of the process that's happening in case the system malfunctions or it operates in a way that we didn't intend it to? So this is the field of AI safety. There's a lot of work going on here. Here's an example from one of our, um, our colleagues at OpenAI. So the game of, this game is called Coast Runners. And the goal of the game is, uh, as understood by humans, is to finish the boat race quickly and preferably ahead of the other players. That's not what the boat is doing, is it? No, it keeps crashing into things and racking up points because OpenAI wanted the system to actually learn how to play fairly and learn the game skills. But as you can see, it's just busy racking up points because that's how it think, thinks it's winning. So it's an example of um, why it's important to have safety measures in place. Because if it does something unintended, you want to be able to understand it and stop it. Um, and I think it is going to be increasingly important as the problems we tackle become more of real, real world issues. Now, our approach here, what are we doing? It's much like designing a car. You don't design a car and then say, oh, let's add a seatbelt and some airbags. No, you design it in from the start, not as bolt-ons. So we take tech safety the same way. We have a team dedicated to it. Uh, much like software engineers have quality and reliability testing, 
We take that same approach with our AI safety. Um, and, but it is more than a technical approach. So an example would be an engineer says, how can we encode values or goals in our AI system? And then the next question comes from our ethicist who says, what goals or values should, be, should the AI be aligned with? Um, so we need these ethicists and philosophers all working together. And it is beyond one company. It is take an industry. We do a lot of work with an organization called Partnership for AI to kind of come to shared understanding of what can happen, what we can all do here. Dual use. Um, this is kind of the, an old, age-old question, of, but an important one of how do you have technology that's designed to help society, but also mitigate risks that, um, that uh, might undermine that. So we believe that anyone developing this technology should, really should be responsible and thinking both about the potential, which I think is very easy for, you know, a lot of engineers are focused and scientists are focused on the upside opportunity. Oh, the downside, I don't know that. It's not my area of expertise. I'm not going to worry about it. And what we're trying to say is actually we need to consider it. So we had this uh, example of text to speech where we had done some research and we had a, a great opportunity for this technology. ALS, you could use it to like capture voice and then as people advance in the disease, they'd still have their voice. And yet you worry about someone trying to imitate a voice in a negative way. So we had a paper we were about to publish and we did an analysis, should we publish the paper or not? And the conversation we had was, let's go ahead and proceed with it because we felt that um, uh, the type of information that we needed to record the way that we recorded the data actually had to be high quality enough and that there were a few other things that really were hard to replicate. So we said, for now, let's proceed with this. Let's also invest in mitigating risks. So are there partners out there who are looking at how to do uh, ways of mitigating voice imitation? What can we do to fund them and accelerate their research as well? So we're, we, took kind of a, we took that approach. Um, I think I've just covered that. Uh, the other thing I just want to highlight here um, is a lot of this stuff just takes time, like to have the proper conversations, to really think through things. They are not easy answers, and they are not perfect answers, so you, but you have to allow the time in order and bring people with different skill sets to the table to do this. Finally, on uh, fairness, um, I think this is a pretty well-known issue. It is a near term. It is a very real issue. I, I think there are examples of this, of like, um, higher job, off, higher offered paid, higher paid jobs get offered to men, kind of queue up than they do to women. Like so, we're propagating a lot of the biases that already exist. Um, we did this experiment on trying. Uh, here it is, kinetic, um, kinetic human action video data set. So AI systems are really good at image classification. We wanted to see if you could do put together a video and have the AI system say what kind of human actions are taking place, like human to human interactions, like hugging or shaking hands, human to object, like playing an instrument. For each class, we had about 600 video clips from YouTube. And what the team was aware of is because the input was already kind of biased, that they were worried that um, it would bias the, uh, the classification. So for example, um, if shaving a beard or dunking a basketball were mostly male videos, then if a female dunked a basketball, would it recognize that that was the action taking place? Um, in the end, we did enough research to say that um, we did enough research to say that, in fact, it wasn't biased. But we highlighted this in the paper that we wrote, such that we could at least raise awareness. I'm getting the time cue, so I'm trying to speed up so we can answer some of your questions. Um, we are continuing to work in this area. There is no simple answer. I think being aware of it, and again, we, we d recently did a paper between one of our computer scientists and an ethicist on how we might address this in a, a different way. Um, I'm going to quickly go through here and hope that you've gotten the point so far. Diversity matters. If we're developing AI, 
systems that are supposed to solve intelligence and use that to solve other problems, then we need to have representative views, diversity views, representatives of society around the table. That could be within the organization. It can be broader than our organization in partnerships with, with different organizations. And so I think this is just something that is very much on all of our minds. We're making a lot of uh, steps in this way, but we, we need partnership to help here. I do want to highlight one thing. Um, we had a research scientist who uh, was trying to figure out how to make this, um, received a the AI system received a jumble mess of inputs and retained them and applied the knowledge to different contexts, much like a human brain. But she's a neurologist and not a computer scientist, so she broke one of the most important rules in, in AI, and she actually tampered with the weights of her AI system, which is something you wouldn't do. So again, bringing diversity into the, tape, into the picture. But if she hadn't trusted her instincts and done that, she would not have uncovered some really great advancements in unsupervised learning. So we need people that aren't familiar with these topics actually experimenting and testing the boundaries so that we can get this right. Um, we're in uncharted territories. And we acknowledge that. And, and I think it's just, it's really important for all of us to be thinking that if AI is going to play such an important role in our future, what, are, what is our responsibility and how can we all participate in defining what this could be? Uh, here are a few resources for you. If you have interest in careers, uh, you can go to our website and we have a careers page. Uh, I often get asked about internships, uh, which are, tend to be graduate level. Uh, if you want to learn more about artificial intelligence, machine learning, Coursera has a lot of classes uh, on the website, including Andrew's course, which now has over 2 million learners. Uh, so plenty of opportunities for people of all levels if you want to learn more about machine learning. And then we've recently launched a, a podcast series that addresses a wide range of topics and a wide range of expertise uh, with Hannah Fry, and you can find that on our website as well. Um, there's also the movie AlphaGo, which I mentioned. Now, uh, as, I, as I said earlier, I wasn't sure about moving to DeepMind and to take on this mission, but I think if you can Im actually imagine how we could use artificial intelligence to actually solve some of these amazing challenges that we've been grappling with that we struggle with. And this is where I think about how AI could be one of the most transformative technologies in our future. Not just my future, but my daughter's futures. And I think that this is a super exciting time. We're very early in the work that we're doing here. And I'm really excited to see not only what DeepMind does, but what the world does, and what Purdue alumni, how Purdue alumni contribute to making this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Lila, for such an exciting, passionate presentation of generality, creativity, complexity in the context of uh, deep mind. Well done, you listened. Uh, yeah, you did. <laughs> you passed the test. <laughs> Learning. <laughs> Maybe not deep. <laughs> and AI for science, as well as covering safety, ethics, bias and the opportunities and challenges for AI in the future. Uh, so the floor is open for questions now. Let's begin right there. Hi. Uh, uh, my name is Isha, and I'm a computer engineering student in vertically integrated projects. And my uh, question is with regards to the building of a generally intelligent system. So when you're building a system that's supposed to mimic human intelligence, how does DeepMind define success for such a system? So this is kind of a two-part question. Um, if the system mimics um, human intelligence or exceeds it, is that defined as success? Or if it mimics it in a very um, similar pattern to how humans generally perform, so like sometimes winning games, sometimes losing games, is that defined as success? And the other part to this is, 
um, is DeepMind taking into account the um, hardware constraints of um, building this kind of system? So, for example, low power systems to mimic the human brain's constraints. Um, like you mentioned before, AlphaGo works because of the whole computational resources that are available, but um, it wouldn't work on a, like a low power system. So, um, could you speak about um, those kinds of constraints yeah. and how to define success? Excellent questions. Um, on the first, the, the second one uh, on the compute infrastructure, um, Alpha Zero, which was the successor to AlphaGo, actually what, um, used less compute, so we were able to make it more efficient. So as it continues to learn, we gain some of these efficiencies. Um, so some is happening in the algorithm, but absolutely on the hardware, from a hardware infrastructure perspective, we're thinking about what is the compute capability uh, required to do this. Uh, so I, th I think it's, you know, we have a team that's dedicated to thinking about energy, and they just earlier this week presented on some of our kind of consumption aspects. So uh, we're not particularly focused on getting it to brain level, but we are thinking about how do we re um, remove the power consumption or power and uh, compute power required. Um, I'm sorry, and the first one was, so it's, um, oh, the brain, what's success look like? Um, what does success look like for humans? It's often about learning. Are we learning? So our actually, as I said, we kind of look at um, our research in six-month chunks. Did we learn something? And uh, the fact that Alpha uh, Star learned how to play StarCraft was like a huge success. Didn't matter if it won or lost. It, we were trying to understand. It eventually played itself enough then that, and played others that it, it learned to win. But it wasn't as much about the winning. It was really about it was continuously learning and improving. That creativity element, the generalizable, the generalizing, generalizing, sorry, uh, and the creative aspects are, are actually quite important for us. So the how and what the outputs are are, are ways that we celebrate progress. My name is Jonathan Snyder. Um, so one of the biggest concerns I have is the militarization of AI, um, specifically using it for military purposes um, in weapons or lethal autonomous systems. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that can be done safely? Are the risks too great to ever do that? Should we even do that? Uh, I, I think the challenge here is on a question like that, everybody has different opinions. Um, we abide by the um, AI principles that Google has pushed, put out, which um, uh, we also take an active role in both defining and uh, implementing, which has some uh, uh, limitations around how much we do with military. Uh, and the way that DeepMind commercializes our work is we do it through Google products. And so that kind of gives, which are then subjected to the AI principles. So we have a, a more red lines, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so we don't, from our perspective and the kind of work that we do, that is not within our scope. Hi, uh, my name is Shatayu, and my question is, so as your reinforcement bots become better and better, like more and more people will think that the best way to get this thing done is via reinforcement learning. So my question becomes like, what do you think the relationship between traditional scientists and uh, reinforcement learning, like computer scientists looking to solve a problem becomes? Like if I were a biologist uh, and I wanted to look at protein folding, do you think that uh, in the future, a future biologist might start coding a reinforcement learning agent instead of like, I don't know, going to like reading through papers and stuff on how things should fold. We actually have biologists too. Yeah, and we have neuroscientists who don't code. Um, so we actually think, and sometimes when we have a strong opinion about a, an approach, we realize that many of our other employees don't feel that way. So we almost sometimes worry that we're over biased in our, our beliefs that we invest in other approaches as well. Like we want that diversity of opinion, um, which is again, the fact that we don't have a roadmap built out and it's more, the building blocks aren't clearly defined. We do have, uh, the way we've structured our research is that we have research scientists uh, and not all of them code. Uh, we have research engineers who they partner with to try to bring their ideas and experiments to life. Hi, my name is Zephyr. I'm a computer engineer. Well, I'm a freshman in computer engineering. Um, so I've noticed that uh, most, if not all, of DeepMind's projects are actually <coughs> analogies 
of major challenges uh, going through artificial intelligence. So you're first solving a board game, and then you're solving multiple board games in one algorithm. And I was curious as to how you evaluate as a company the relevance of these analogies, so of these tasks to the actual challenges that you're solving. So how are you determining that they're actually successful analogies? Yes. Uh, so one of the founders, uh, the CEO, Demis Hassabis, who you saw in the video, um, he was a uh, world champ champion chess player as a child, as a as youth, and really believes that kind of games are easy, uh, not easy, uh, games are good ways to like test, uh, to, to simulate the intelligence, because you know if you've won or lost, you know when the game is over. Uh, so it's, it provides a con um, confined system. Uh, we do other approaches as well that, um, uh, you know, things, you know, you can test things like memory in here or planning or other aspects. So what we've tried to do is say, what are some of the capabilities that we want to develop? How does that relate to some of the games that are on the market? Um, and, and take more of a capability approach. So some of these things, as you've mentioned, are like long-standing challenges in AI, but we are taking a broader view of both games and also kind of creating our own games based on the types of tasks that we want to test for uh, to see how, um, if we're able to do a lot of tasks with the same algorithm. Time for a couple of questions. Hello, uh, I'm Manu, and uh, this question is uh, somewhat off what you showed on the slide. So, but since you are at the top position, I want to ask you this. So, what is your business model and how do you pay your employees? Mm -hmm. And since you do research, uh, it's mainly research, do you have any pressure from the top level so that you generate revenue? Uh, as you showed, uh, I, don't, I didn't see any bounce like that. So, you do whatever you feel like doing without any uh, restrictions. Uh, to commercialize what you're doing. So without such things, how do you pay your employees? And if, say, I want to start a similar company like that, so what is the business model? <laughs> Thank you. So it was a conscious and act proactive decision that the company was acquired by Alphabet um, because what that does is secure long-term funding, and it was an agreement from the start. I mean, if you think about the founders of Google, they were, you know, Larry Page and Sergey. They, they thought about organizing the world's information. That's basically AI, right? Um, and so having that long-term view, Alphabet has a lot of different bets that they've made in, um, you know, Waymo for autonomous cars, um, Loon for internet, et cetera. So this is seen as like a long-term research. Now, as I mentioned, we do take some of our research and commercialize it through Google, where we provide inter like internal value. Uh, so, and we get paid in cash and Google stock, <laughs> <laughs> and really good beverages uh, and snacks in our, in our kitchenettes. Um, uh, no, seriously, um, I do think it is a big question of like people always ask me this of like, what's your business model? And it's we're not a traditional company. Okay, we are more like a research institute as a scientific, uh, scientific organization. And we think about our work not in terms of product launches and uh, monetization, but rather like an Apollo-like program, right? With a long-term vision, kind of audacious, how are we going to get there? And again, that is uh, the partnership that we have and the acquisition that we had with Alphabet. Hi. Um, so it's hard to imagine a machine or a computer being creative, because it's not usually you associate machines with creativity. So how do you even start making a computer cr be creative? That's a good philosophical question. Um, and I think this is actually, my advice is watch uh, AlphaGo, because you will see <laughs> You will see that, that move and where, again, when you're not telling, you know, we do a lot of things because that's how it's been passed down to us or we imitate how others are doing it and how we perceive it to be successful. 
But if you're unconstrained by that, if you can think of new ways of doing things and getting to places, then you might have that same creativity. Um, and I think that's really what we're learning from our work with, um, uh, through our advanced artificial intelligence systems. Great. Uh, let's, uh, we're at time, so uh, let's uh, give Lila a big hand for not only the great talk. But, but also for the inspiring uh, examples she says through her own life experience. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.